They lived only to face a new nightmare. The war against the machines. What's up guys, Larry Chen here. Welcome to another episode of Hoonigan Autofocus. Today we're focusing on the future of autos. Specifically, the future of car racing. This thing is so crazy, I don't even know. Is this even a car? What is this? Maybe it's just a machine. But uh, my buddy Chip here is going to explain to us a little bit about what this is. First of all, Chip and I, we have a very interesting history, right? We do. So Chip and I, we actually worked together many years before. Um, he actually helped run the Global Rallycross series, which Lewis and I were actually the official photographers. We had a really good time following basically the premier Rallycross series in North America. And, uh, you know, Ken and Tanner and all, Bucky Lasik, all of like, I guess the action sports stars, even Travis Pastrana race in this series. We had a really good time. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where that kind of style of racing wasn't very prevalent in the U.S. And you guys brought it over. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, um, it was an interesting thing. We saw it in, uh, we saw it in Europe. And they're like, you know what, we can make this a little bit cooler. Um, and uh, it was amazing how it took off. It became the fastest growing motorsport in the US. Um, and I used to sit in race control and just kind of watch where you would pop up anywhere on the track because it was always someplace we didn't expect. Um, and that's how you got the great shot. So those were, uh, those were good times. Yeah, those were good times. Uh, we loved uh, causing trouble. I mean, I, <laughs> I guess to get the good shots for you guys, but that's like old hat now. That's like old racing. Potentially, the new generation of racing is going to be something like this. So tell us a little bit about what this is. Yeah, I mean, that, Larry, and that's, that's, why, that's why I came here is and kind of, you know, with, with, with Rallycross, we were kind of doing something new in racing. And uh, this, is, this is the future. Um, it is a self-driving racing series. Um, so in other words, no drivers. Um, the drivers are the AI that are in the car. Um, the car has a variety of sensors on it. It's looking all around it and it's, pa it's planning its own path. Uh, so it's, um, this, this particular car is electric. Um, it'll go almost 200 miles an hour. Um, pretty capable vehicle. So it's a lot of work, um, but we do see it as being the future. Every time you pick up a, a newspaper or, 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 or look at your feed, you see something about autonomous and this is the proving ground for autonomous. I just, my mind is so blown right now. Uh, I mean, I guess right now th this is something where right now you guys are in the proving stage, right? Like, cause you have to prove to people that this is interesting. This is uh, potentially more exciting to watch than traditional racing. And maybe right now your, your goal is to show that, hey, this is actually faster potentially than traditional race cars because there's no human element to it. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, this is obviously a big debate and um, people always ask me, it's like, will it ever go faster than a, than a professional human driver in a car? And we believe very strongly that it will because it, ha it already has superhuman capabilities in, in a few areas. Um, if you think about it, it has, it has four brake pedals, it has four throttles, um, and it has, the, it has the, the computing power to be able to decide what to do. Um, so it's sensing the physics, it's sensing everything around it. We're not quite there, uh, but we're pretty close. Uh, we're within about 1% of human, human potential right now with the car. And on top of that, it may be AI, right? It may be the fact that it's computers racing against each other, but there's still physics involved, right? So there's still uh, surface changes, um, temperature changes, the track is not always the same lap after lap. There's marbles on the, on the track. And also these race racers, racers, they could take way crazier risks versus a human. No, absolutely true. And you know, but the, the important thing to remember is, is there's still humans involved. 
the entire software stack that goes into this is coded by humans. And one of the, one of the, one of the primary questions I get, they're like, hey, well, if it's all AI and it's all computer controlled, they should all go right to the limit, they should all go the same speed, and it'll just be you know, a train going around, going around the track. Um, the differences in, in, the, in, the, in the software stacks and how they're programmed and what strategies the, the humans behind these, these uh, software stacks put in place, and that's the performance difference. So, um, and yeah, um, we will be able to take huge risks with these things. You know, it's something in, in GRC, which we were talking about, we used to put the drivers in the car and say, here, go over a gap jump. And uh, it would have been a lot more comfortable to do that with these autonomous vehicles. Right, so these, well, which by the way, honestly, the biggest jumps in any race I've ever seen. I mean, I'm talking about clearing serious gaps, which by the way, uh, it's not just a gap. It, they, many times it would actually be clearing the track, which means cars would be going under Underneath. the cars that were flying over yeah. you. And then uh, there, there was that one very hairy time where I think Bucky Lasik had to bail out and he did like a kind of like a 50-50 uh, you know, like a like a little skateboard trick on the ramp. He did a whole grind down the ramp. Yeah, yeah it yeah. was uh, it was uh, it was very Bucky. Yeah, yeah. very skateboard like, very awesome. Um, but that's kind of the thing with these cars. Potentially, you could have 360 loops, or you could have these parts of the track where it's completely 90 degrees, um, and they have to use their arrow and the speed to kind of stay on top of it. We are working for stuff in the future competitions with this. That is, I mean, literally you just, it's whatever you can dream up. Um, if, you know, what we do is we then go in, we look at the physics and we just have to figure out, okay, what are the performance parameters of the car to do it? And, um, you know, and then we, we do the engineering on it. And, you know, as you said, we're not putting life at risk that way. We might put a car at risk. We might crash a car or two trying it, trying it out. Um, but we're going to be able to do some some stunning, stunning things with these cars. I'm going to butcher this quote, but it's like the whole Ayrton Senna quote. It's like if there if you don't take a gap that exists, you're you, you're no longer a racing driver, yeah. right? Yeah. That's what he says. So with these, what do they do? You know, if there's a gap that exists, there's so many calculations that happen in terms of, hey, do I take this gap and potentially risk wrecking both? me and the car that I'm passing, or the cars, or, and then when these other vehicles in microseconds see that this certain vehicle is gonna take that gap, what do they do? Do they close the gap and then risk wrecking both? Or, you know, there's just so much, I mean, that, we're talking about Terminator here at this point, you know, like, there's just so much going on. Uh, Terminator of the racing world, I, I just, it, it gets me excited just thinking about it. You know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting philosophical question, and we're in the process right now of working on a, on a whole new overtaking uh, protocol, uh, and we do that in a technical working group with all the teams. And the big part of it was is actually writing the rule. What is the regulation that they're going to be based on? Um, and it answers it answers those questions. So then they have to work backwards from there and program to that to that regulation. Um, and if you program it to it the vehicle will do it. Um, and that's, that's the interesting thing. We'll, we'll all be spectators and we'll see how this works out. Um, but they know what they have to program to from an overtaking rule standpoint. So in other words, if you close the door and you crash out the other car, that's going to go against you. Right. You can take, we, we want them to be able to take defensive maneuvers. I don't like where motorsport is all, all regulated and you can't block and everything. I think it's really, really cool to do that. But they have to calculate the risk and make sure the other car can slow down in time when it sees it. That's interesting because in, in essence, they can get penalized for something that they programmed into the, the software. Absolutely. And, and the cool thing about it is, is uh, you know what it's like when you talk to a racing driver um, after a... Uh, after uh, after an event, and it's like it's no, it's never anybody's fault. It's always the other the other the other driver's fault. Here, we just go look at the code and we see what was there, and it's black and white. Okay, so I know part one of your jobs at uh, Global Rally Cross was to make that call. Sometimes a lot of people uh, kind of mentioned to me um, about Formula Drift. They're like, "Hey, this is not a motorsport. It's kind of whack because it's judged, right?" Well. Uh, realistically, pretty much traditional motorsports are also judged. 
I mean, unfortunately, you had to be the judge many times when it came to incidents on who to set fault or who to penalize, whatnot. Is that something, I guess, is that the human element potentially for something like this? It is, but again, we can go back and look at the code. Um, so there is, there's less gray area. You know, I mean, I had a, I had a lot of conversations with Ken about calls when we, uh, back in, back in the global rallycross days. And in this one, there's just, there's so much more data available. So we look at exactly what was the car doing? Why did the computer tell the car to do that? And what in the code told the car to do that? So I'm hoping as, as, as someone that needs to make those calls that I can just take a look at that and it's black and white and I don't have to spend three hours after the race um, at the track uh, going, through, going through arguments about those things. Ah, uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the thing that a lot of people don't realize about motorsports. All right, so let's talk about the car itself. So obviously there's no place for a person to say it. Yep. Uh, tell us about the car. It's essentially a drone on four wheels. Um, we call it a four-wheel robot. Um, it is, uh, it's electric powered. Uh, so it's, this, whole, this whole area is basically full of batteries. Um, and the batteries are down low because they're the heaviest part. Um, so we want to get the CG as low as possible. Um, it's got motors front and rear. Um, so it is all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive. Um, it's capable of just about 200 miles per hour. Uh, last year, we set the Guinness World Record for the world's fastest autonomous car. Um, the, uh, it, from a build standpoint, it is, it's, it's a Formula One level build. Um, it's a full carbon fiber chassis, um, inboard suspension, of course. Um, we do run on basically a street tire. It's a Michelin Pilot Sport 2, more or less. It, it's a very similar tire that you see in, uh, in Formula E. Um, so that brings its, that brings its, uh, its total grip down a little bit. Um, but it's a, it's an incredibly capable car. Um, Later this season, we look to uh, go out and just in, and show everyone what this car can do. Um, it, as I said, it has superhuman capabilities, and we want to show those things to to, every, to our all our fans. So, is this is a version two of the race car? This this is the this is the original Robocar. Oh, okay. This is the original Robocar, and this um, it, it's kind of interesting because it still has like a car form factor which it potentially doesn't need to, right? It potentially could have three wheels in the front or whatever, all these different things to give it more traction. Is that something potentially in the future, like other teams, uh, they may not look the same? Um, with, with RoboRace, one of the things we're trying to do is um, we're trying to standardize the platform. We don't want this to be a spending race as far as developing your own, your own car. We want, we want all of the effort to go into the software stack. Um, so uh, we are working on a generation three car. We'll be announcing that in a, in a, in a little bit. Uh, we do like the four wheel, the four wheel setup. Um, it works for a lot of different reasons and battery packaging and motors. And you usually want to put a motor in between the front axle. You want to put a motor between the, between the rear axle. So from a packaging standpoint, it works out, it works out very well. Um, but uh, the, uh, in this car, I think it kind of, set a new standard for a drone and we always look for we always look to do that with anything we do with cars in the future well potentially and part of it is that it's relatable yeah. right you look at it, it, it you give it to anyone you give it to a kid uh like a model version they'll know that it's a car it has four wheels um it, it still has a shape of a car and it actually is very aggressive and it looks great but there's just no place for the driver no that's right and uh it's uh you said for kids, it is super popular as a Hot Wheels car. Um, they always uh, they always sell out. I think we've uh, I think we've sold o over six hundred thousand uh, Robocar Hot Wheel cars now, um, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, it's relatable. You know, it's you know it's a car, um, and that's important to what we do at RoboRace um, because our competitions and everything we do, we we want it to be road relevant. Um, autonomous cars are coming coming here. You know, and in five years we'll probably be riding around in the back seat of our cars. And that is the primary mission behind RoboRace is to show people this is safe, um, it can be done, they have superhuman capabilities, and, um, and we can do some really cool things with them. So do you think you'll take this and compete against traditional race cars? Like for example, I could imagine this going up Pikes Peak. The, um, I think we will. Um, you know, RoboCar is, it's our first car. Um, 
we uh, we're working on a little bit of a evolution of it, um, but we want to set some records with this, and we want to we want to do that set records, show people what aut autonomous can do, um, because it is it's a big. It's kind of a big campaign for people to accept autonomous um, and what's coming. You know, they always talk about level one and level two and level three and level four and level five autonomous. You know, and we're kind of running these at a level five level on the racetrack, um, which is very cool. Hmm. All right. So, in terms of stats, is there any other stats you could tell me, like uh, estimated horsepower or any of those kind of things? Um, it goes. I, I, can, I can give you some performance stats. Um, the uh, it uh, it's around 200 miles an hour. Um, it's zero to 60 uh, in about 2.4 seconds, uh, quarter mile about 10.1 seconds. Um, so it's 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 quick. Um, the uh, battery packs in it right now. We'll probably look to uh, we'll probably look to optimize those a little bit. Um, and uh, those performance figures that I've given you, it's like we never went out and did a full optimization on quarter mile, for instance. We just kind of put the car out there, pressed the button, ran it. We did it, and we took the we took the time off the data. Um, so, we uh, in the future, I hope we can take a look at some of those things and optimize it. And um, you talk about uh, you talk about um, going up Pikes Peak, and that is a that's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge from an autonomous standpoint, but we're it's something we look at. Uh, for instance, we did Goodwood. Uh, we set the record. Uh, we did the very first run with this car at Goodwood in 2018. We set the record in 2019 with DevBot, our other car, the DevBot 2.0. And um, uh, Goodwood is like a small version of Pikes Peak because um, you can't use GPS or anything. You have to go off LIDARs because there's all kinds of tree cover and everything. And Pikes Peak would be that level challenge times 10 just because it's so long. Well, I mean, in terms of electric race cars, you know, that's kind of what sold me on electric. You know, seeing the, um, first of all, Reese Millen uh, breaking the electric record and then you know, Romain Dumas coming out with uh, Volkswagen IDR, Pikes Peak, and smashing the overall record by over a minute, right? Yeah. That, that's honestly what sold me, because we were w working for Volkswagen for that race, and man, when that thing passed by you, oh my God, it, it would almost knock you over because of how much air, air it's moving. Yeah. You know, you could physically see the shock wave that it was creating because the plants and the dust on the side of the road just gets knocked over. It's a, it's a stunning, stunning vehicle with incredible, incredible performance. You think about how long people have been going up Pikes Peak and, and with vehicles, you know, coyotes that are built specifically, specifically for that, and they kind of rock up with that thing and, and do what they did. Um, at Goodwood uh, last year, uh, we, were actually, we were actually pitted right next to uh, the, the VW IDR, and um, it was, uh, it was uh, it was really cool to kind of have both these cars kind of right next to each other and the uh, you know from our from our old days in GRC the the VW uh, head of motorsport was there and we were kind of talking about you know the things that could be possible um, you know to one day do that autonomously. Hmm. Um, one other thing I noticed about this car it actually is using um, kind of like off the shelf things maybe not off the shelf but like more custom. Uh, pieces that are actually made that that you could see on other cars, right? Obviously, like the wheels, BBS, and then also the brakes. Are those uh, made by Brembo or? They're APs in the rear. Oh, APs yeah. and what the fronts? Brembos, I believe. Okay, so it, it's kind of interesting that you guys are maybe to keep costs down, but also again the relatability thing. Yep. You know, because you still need brakes. Maybe in the future, potentially, it could be all regen. Who knows? But it's kind of cool that there is still that part, meaning like if the, you guys do have like a, a race um, where you need to do a mid-race tire change, then that's again where the human element comes in, yep. right? The, the human element of actually being the pit guy to have to, you know, the car comes in, <laughs> brakes are smoking, everything is going crazy. They have to do a fast pit stop yep. to get this back out in the race. Yep. I think that's really cool. That's where the mixture is, um, and that it is a motorsport. And as we say, it's kind of motorsport 2.0. So, um, you know, when you look at what does motorsport do, well, it pushes the envelope on technology. So, that's always kind of the first place you stop to kind of to kind of find the pieces for it. A lot of pieces on this car come from the come from the motorsport world. 
Um, you know, and then there were some things that we needed to invent. We needed to invent the autonomous stuff because nobody had ever done that before. We needed to in invent the drivetrain because nobody had ever done it and tried to package it this way before. But um, there's just, you know, there's so much stuff out there that works. It's great. I mean, obviously, next generation uh, brakes will be a little bit different because we're doing, you know, we have to look at regen. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's things that work out there. And as I, and we're, we're not looking to reinvent the automobile. We want it to be road, road relevant. What we are looking to do is, is push the boundaries on the AI that's inside of it. Okay. Hmm. One other thing that I just thought of that I can't wait to see, and I feel like you guys have to do this. So we always hear about the stat F1 cars, they have so much downforce they could drive upside down, right? Yes. This potentially could be something where we could actually see that happen and there's no risk to a human being. Yep. Yeah, I think that's pretty, that, I think that's the gem. That's something I would like to see. Let's be honest, there's always gonna be traditional racing. Yep. You know, people will always wanna race against each other, yep. but you know, it's something where this can coexist also because this is something where it's pushing the physical limitation of uh, actual racing and also it, it pushes the whole autonomous thing because as you guys know, with racing, the technology in racing eventually comes down to normal road cars, right? So the technology potentially that you guys are developing with RoboRace could come down to road cars that we actually can enjoy you know, in day-to-day -day life. No, and that's, that's, that brings us back to the whole reason of it. I mean, you think about when motor racing started over a hundred years ago now, why did it, why did it start? It started to show people that these vehicles with a, with a bunch of parts in it could actually be dependable. That's why you had 24 hour races and 500, 500 mile races and things like that. Likewise, that's what Robo Race um, is, 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 is here to do, is to show people that autonomously driven vehicles can perform at a very, very high level and they can do it very, very safely. Um, so, and everything that's learned here then trickles down to, to what's happening. So it's, it's just, it's, it's kind of history repeating itself with a whole new set of technology. So how many sensors does this actually have for it to be able to, like it says radar here, right? And I don't know, I guess, I'm guessing all yep, of these. Yep, there are sensors are. around. So depending on, the, depending on the vehicles, we have anywhere between about eight to 14 sensors. Um, and then depending on what the run is, and, and, and what we're trying to do, um, that, depend, that, that helps us decide which sensors we're gonna use. Um, and there can be a fusion of all the sensors. Um, and it can be LiDAR sensors, it can be radar sensors, it can be what we call an AI camera or, 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 or photo sensors, um, and uh, even, uh, even a GPS, um, differential GPS on the cars we'll use it some, sometimes. I love all the markings here, like this is where you tow the car. Yep. <laughs> Instead of you know, doing it on the loop, yeah. or on the, on the hoop uh, behind the driver. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah we, don't, we don't have the hoop, so we had, yeah. to come up, we had to come up with something, and luckily the car bounces perfectly on that, so yeah. quite a bit of engineering went into that. So this is a... Uh, GPS antenna. Okay. Antennas. Oh, GPS. So they're differential, yep. Right, okay. It's all these little things, like, I mean, things that I potentially could recognize, but also things that I have no idea what the heck it is, <laughs> so... Yep, a lot of sensors up front, and... You know, but when you start looking down, I mean, I love the contours on this vehicle. When you start looking through, you can see the wishbones. They look very much like a Formula One wishbone in there. Um, but then if you keep the camera focused there, it's really cool the way the air is directed. The air is directed and it comes through here. And this, this comes up to create some downforce. Um, but we still keep a lot of air going into the brakes. Um, and then same thing, same thing back here. We have a fender to shroud the tire. But Air is directed through here. Again, kind of Formula One uh, style wishbones, but if you come back here, took these wishbones and actually put little airfoils on them so we can create some, create some downforce here. And then obviously a big, a big diffuser with a gurney back here. Um, so the, a lot of detailing went into the design of it. So part of it is that you guys legitimately need to make it uh, good looking, but also functional, right? Yeah. Because it's, it has to be both because it's, it's, I'm sure it's easy for you guys to make it fast and that's it, but it potentially could look ugly as sin. Yeah, this one, this one actually started out with a concept design first 
um, and then the engineering kind of happened with it. And it is all through the center spine. It is packed tight. It is, um, it's not the easiest car to work on, um, but it is, uh, we, we felt it was going to be the world's first autonomous race car. Um, and it needed to, uh, it needed to look right. Hmm. All right. So one last question, where do you think we'll be able to see this run next? We are, um, we're working on a couple things. So we have season beta coming, um, which is our competition season. Uh, we're gonna start that up uh, hopefully in September. We're on a little bit of a pause because of COVID. Um, so we'll do, uh, we'll do 12 race seasons starting in September that'll run through April of 2021. Uh, we're still looking at what cars we have where and what cars will run. But in addition to that, we're also working on some special projects. I told you about setting some more records. So we're going to work on, uh, we're going to work on setting some records with this and engineering's working on what's possible. And, uh, I hope to be doing an announcement about that, that soon. Uh, when you say race series, so you'll have multiple cars, then. multiple cars. So the first part of the, the first part of the race series will be, um, will be single car running, uh, with virtual obstacles on the track. Um, and then the latter half of the race series will have multiple cars on the track at a time. Hmm. And that's like potentially like different teams putting in different software to see how much faster it can go around a course with obstacles. Correct. Correct. So we have, uh, we have five teams on board right now. We're just onboarding a six team. Um, and that's our, that's our limit, uh, for, for season beta. And then, uh, and I, I think we'll expand. We have a lot of interest right now. We'll, we'll expand to more teams, uh, coming up for season one. Season one will start, uh, late summer, 2021. Well, it's just It'll be very interesting to see. I can't wait to photograph it. And I mean, I don't even know how I would photograph it. I guess I, the human element, of course, would be the engineers and uh, the people on the team doing the software side of it and also the mechanics. But there's no driver for me to shoot, you know, like the, usually the drivers are the ones giving me the cheesy smiles and the thumbs up. And I tell them, no, don't pretend like I'm not here. Well, this thing will not know if I'm there or not. <laughs> you know, so it's pretty cool to to think that potentially that could be something that I'm photographing in the future. Well, I'm sure you'll be standing someplace that surprises me, no matter, uh, no matter what we do. Um, but, uh, we do have, I mean, for every team that's out there, there's six to en six to 10 engineers that come along, but they're usually staring into a computer screen. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's about, that's about all you see of them. Well, I can't wait to do surprise, you know, just <laughs> pop, pop, pop yeah, up in too. the middle of the track. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I think that'll be a lot of fun. Thank you so much for going over this awesome project with us. So tell us a little bit about what this is. Yeah, so this thing is, this thing is pretty awesome. We call this the, the VR rig. And if you see, as you can see on Robocar, so this is built on a Robocar show car. There's no place for a human like to sit or do anything, right? And when we had our, uh, our event at Goodwood Festival of Speed back in 2018, we were thinking like, well, we need to create a fan experience, something that they can do with the car besides just looking at it or get their photo taken with it. It's like, we want them to experience the thrill of what, you know, riding with Robocar could be like doing the Goodwood Hill Climb. And we thought like, well, what sort of position would it be, right? Would it be like riding a horse or like a rocket or something? It's like, well, let's just have it like, let's just have, you know, the person flying over the car doing the hill climb. Well, this is, so it's, in a way, you're like kind of strapped to it. Like, this is the, this is really kinky, sir. Like, yeah. <laughs> what the heck? It's, oh my God. It's, it's, it's definitely a unique position, right? But like, when you get on it, I mean, you really like in VR, when you're looking around, the Robocar is directly underneath you. You start doing the hill climb, you hang on. The motion profile for the experience is actually taken off the data of the hill climb. So it's at fully 100% accurate down to all the motion and also even the wind in your face. So this fan is actually, Whoa. It's, uh, it's designed around the experience. So depending on how fast you're going through the hill climb in VR, the speed adjusts to it. So when you're on there, when you're on the rig and it's moving, you got the goggles, you got the wind in your face, it's really convincing. And for me, like I've ridden this thing hundreds of times and I still like, I still get off this thing and like, oh man, I gotta do it again. That was super awesome. And our fans have loved it. And, uh, you know, so, so you're not actually controlling, you're not, you're, you're just hanging on, you're enjoying the ride. That's so funny because, uh, is this potentially something in the future, uh, for you guys, would you guys build like a rubber race car where you either strap a fan to it or actually have a fan sit inside of it? 
I think so. I mean, you know, we're all about like how do we create a unique fan experience that's outside of the box because here at Robo Race it's like we don't do things the way everyone else does them, obviously, right? We run our cars off of AI. There's no human drivers or passengers involved in this case. So really kind of reinventing what that fan experience could be, whether it's at home or even at an event. Uh, yeah, I mean, anything's possible with what we do. Well, because for me, there's such a disconnect, right? The, I am a big fan of open wheel racing, um, but for a lot of people, especially here in America, there's such a disconnect because they can't relate to that. You know, they, a lot of Americans didn't grow up karting, right? So they don't understand what it's like to, you know, feel that many G-forces and take corners at that speed. So for example, like Honda, they have that um, two-seater IndyCar experience, right? So you potentially could go 200 miles per hour around Indianapolis Raceway um, with whomever. Uh, I actually had a chance to experience that with Mari Andretti of all people. And it's just something that you never would think, it, it, you, you just can't imagine it until you actually do it. So it's like one of those things where I was going around Pocono Raceway and it's like, oh, there's the grandstands. And there's the grandstands again. Yeah. And again. And it's like, and I try to straighten my head, but nope, too much G-force. <laughs> my head is just gonna be like this the whole way. Uh, this is kind of cool because in a way, I get that this is the way it is right now for VR, just to kind of show what, what you guys are trying to do. But honestly, in the future, if you guys do build an uh, AI race car with a place for a human to actually sit, that would be amazing because you're experiencing something that potentially humans physically couldn't do. Totally. Totally. And that's, and that's just the thing with what we do is like really creating new experiences, really reinventing the way, uh, you know, motorsports and these fan experiences happen. Uh, for us, the traditional form of motorsports, it's amazing. It's obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a legacy format, but for us, it's like, what's new? What's different? What can we do better? And how do we create an entirely new experience for an entirely new fan base as well, right? It's like the traditional motorsports fan, uh, they're awesome. But for us, it's like, well, there's a whole, new, a whole nother group of fans that are more into, you know, the virtual space or, you know, creating their own competitions. Uh, you know, how, how can we get them engaged in what we do in a very different way? And we're always looking for those uh, challenges and, and, uh, and ways to engage as well. Well, once you guys do build something like that, you definitely have to call it the vomit rocket because there's, there's going to... We might have had a couple of close calls with this one. There's going to be a lot of vomiting. Yeah, because it's like, I think with a lot of fans, when they get on this thing, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a couple minutes to get on this and to get situated and everything, and people are kind of skeptical at first, like, ah, you know, what is it? And then they get off, they're like, holy crap, this thing was crazy, right? We've had a couple of people like, oh, this is kind of crazy, you know? Turn it off, it's too intense. But you know, when they get up, they're like, oh man, that was really awesome. I actually want to try it again. So, so it's got the actuators from a company called D-Box. Uh, uh, they have the motion actuators here. And then uh, you obviously, you, this is the headset. It's an HTC Vive. And uh, we got the fan that goes about 80 miles an hour. So when you mix all those elements together, and even here, the monitor, which you see over here, this is something that we, so when we bring this to an event, um, you know, this is the fans see what you're actually seeing while you're on it. So it's, it's pretty, it's, it's a pretty unique experience. But again, you know, when you're watching here versus when you're actually on it, completely different experience. All right, PC gaming nerd me is really excited about this. So, well, well I'm gonna try it out right now. All right. Are you Batman? I'm Batman. Whoa. Whoa, this is crazy. You're a wizard. Oh my God. I remember shooting here. Wait a minute. This is insane. It actually feels like you're going fast. Oh, it's so windy. Wow. Crazy.
Where did you guys get the data for that? Like, where did you guys, like, it, was that, like, scanned for this? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the motion profile and the video and everything, that was all captured from the actual run during one of the practice oh. hill climbs. So that was, like, before the actual event then? Yeah, yeah, this was during one of the practice runs. Okay, I see. Yeah, because it looked like, like, really early morning. Yeah. Yeah, so they gave us, uh, you know, specific times when we could test. And obviously, we're in a unique situation because we don't have, like, a, an onboard steward or anything, right? It's like, yeah. so they gave us the, the Goodwood um, uh, uh, team, they gave us specific times where we could go test either really early in the morning or late at night when, you know, the crowds are gone and the rest of the cars were done doing their thing. So, yeah. So, compared to other cars, um, how well did this do at Goodwood? So it, it ran very consistent times on every session. Uh, we were obviously speed limited, and that was actually our choice, just to ensure safety for everything. Um, in 2018, that was actually the first time we went and did the hill climb. Um, so we were limited to, I think it was 75 or 80 miles an hour. But we were totally confident we can go much faster we can do. So then, in essence, this is like true speed, like? Yeah, this is, this is meant to replicate uh, the run precisely. So the speed of the fan and the motion and everything is taken right off of the, the data. So do, is there somebody standing by um, just ready to kill the car right away? There, there is, there is the, the big red button to shut it, you know, at the, the, uh, the safe stop to shut down. We have a, we have a lot of safety parameters. There's obviously uh, safety on the car and remotely. You know, we can shut the car down. So there's a lot of different ways uh, we can make sure it's completely safe. But when we hit the go button, it's kind of like, the car is do, it's doing its own thing. So what happens at the end? Does it like, pro, did you program it to do victory d donuts or burnouts or anything? We, we would have if we could have, so <laughs> we're fully capable of doing that. Oh, really? Yeah. So would you be able to program it to do uh, a front burnout and rear burnout where it's like going against each other? Totally. It's, it's all wheel independent drive, the Robocar is, so we could do whatever we want with this thing. Okay. All right. Listen. I'm not a fan of this unless I see uh, doing a front and rear burnout where it's going opposite ways. Well, we have our, uh, our facility all done. We'll have to invite you guys. and It'll be one of the first things we do. All right. I hope you guys have more of these uh, assume the position uh, things here because it's pretty fun doing this. Assume the position.